The Land Rover Discovery 5 is a very premium product, and in many ways, you could say it is the archetypal posh seven-seat SUV. But things were a little bit different 30 years ago. The Disco has turned the grand old age of 30, and in those last three decades, it's changed from being a rugged lifestyle vehicle to one that's now properly premium. To tell the story, we need to go back to the mid-1980s. Now, Land Rover was faced with two different ways of creating the Discovery. They could have taken the 110 station wagon and upscaled it, or they could have taken the Range Rover and downscaled it, and they went with the second option. Now, they went with that option, but they also had to keep the prices down as much as possible, hence why this car really raided the Austin Rover parts bin. A uh, few examples include the headlamps, they're taken from the Freight Rover Sherpa van. There are a couple of other things as well, which I shall go on to in a minute. But because this is based on the Range Rover chassis and drivetrains, it also used the same engines. Well, it used the same V8, not quite the same V8. Under the bonnet is a 3.5 litre V8, but it wasn't the injected version. That was purely for the Range Rover. And this car only came with a manual gearbox. He also didn't come until much later. Now, coming along the sides, and you'll see that this car is an early three-door. In the first two, well, the first year to two years of Discovery life, you could only have a three-door because Land Rover didn't want to cannibalize Range Rover sales. And again, yes, there is the Morris Marina door handle, another example of parts sharing. Now, further along the sides, you'll see that distinctive kink in the roof and these alpine style windows. You'll discover why they're there in a minute. It's not a design feature, it's there purely for practical purposes. And when we come round to the back, again, yes, you'll see another lamp cluster. It looks very familiar, doesn't it? That's because it was taken from the Austin Montego. Now, when you open the absolutely enormous and heavy rear door, you can see that you've got an absolutely in massive loading space. Now, you can have this car back in 1989 as a seven seat or as a five seat, and most people went for the seven seat version. We've got the rarer five seat version here. And then you can see why you've got this kink in the roof and the Alpine style windows, because if you've got two seats here, one from either side, they pop down, that gives you the headroom and that gives you a little bit of extra light as well. And uh, another thing I want to tell you about, ever wondered why there is this kink in the window? Well, because there, you didn't have parking sensors or rear view cameras back in the late 1980s, that little drop in the window allowed people, when they were looking over their shoulder, to give them a bit of extra visibility. Now that design feature stayed all the way up until the third generation Discovery, when it swapped to the other side. And they did that because the Discovery sold better in left-hand drive markets. And that continued through the Discovery 4, and then we get to the famous Discovery 5 with its uh, rather opinion-splitting rear end. But if you look very closely at that car, you can see this line is repeated around the number plate. Bet you didn't know that. Now, even now it's 30 years old, this interior, it still looks pretty cool in here. Now, blue is the only option until 1992 when you could choose from a beige option as well, but I think the blue looks really cool. Now, Land Rover didn't actually design this interior, they got in Conran, and you can tell that because it's got a bit of a sort of a home feel. You could say the Discovery is the first lifestyle SUV that has an environment. It doesn't have an interior, an austere interior. It is just, it's a nice place to be. Now, like I say, Conran designed this interior. One thing that didn't make production is, well, this trim, this sort of pattern in various places, especially around the gear lever. Now, originally Conran designed it as a pimple design, but Land Rover said, that's gonna be wildly impractical. So they turned the pimple design inside out. And because a few of the Land Rover designs were actually uh, big golfing enthusiasts, it's got a golf sort of look to it, hasn't it? Now, yes, there is a bit of part sharing in here. These stalks are straight from Austin Maestro, but these buttons here were totally bespoke, but the whole thing just works really nicely. Now, five-door version of this car didn't arrive until 1990, nor did an automatic gearbox. This is the most pure a Land Rover Discovery could ever be. And I think it looks absolutely brilliant. 
Ah, one other thing. <laughs> Look at these seat belts. Look, even the seat belts were designed. Such a cool car, this. Priced from just under £16,000, you had the choice for a 3.5-litre carburettor-fed V8 or the 2.5-litre 200 TDI diesel in this very early discovery. It's gruff but not unpleasant, and the car is surprisingly easy to drive. With that blue interior, it's fun too, but it is sparsely equipped. Electric windows, central locking and electric mirrors were all options. In fact, the Discovery really was the first lifestyle SUV thanks to a multitude of different accessories. If three doors were a little impractical for you, in 1990 you could order a five-door model with the rear doors pinched from the Range Rover. And there was a new 162 bhp 3.9 litre injection V8 which replaced the carburettor version. Smoother and silkier, the Disco was starting to get its airs and graces. 1993 saw a new 2 litre petrol added, and in 94, a little facelift saw more safety kit added, and to make the disco appeal to the Yanks, a new ES trim with leather seats and aircon was added. The Discovery began its move up market. By 1998, it was all over. The car that had saved Land Rover was facing the chop. This one is the last Discovery one ever built and, rather amazingly, was donated to the Heritage Motor Center. It was sold off in 2002 and had two further owners unaware of its history. The Discovery was a huge success for Land Rover and a second generation car was never in doubt. The Discovery 2 of 1998 may have looked very similar to the original but every panel was new apart from the tailgate. It was a bit longer due to the two rearmost seats now being front facing and thanks to BMW now holding the purse strings it was much better built. It was more fun to drive thanks to self-leveling suspension and power came from a 2.5 litre TD5 diesel and a 4 litre V8. A facelift arrived in 2002 and this car took part in the gruelling G4 Challenge. 2004 saw the launch of the Discovery 3, probably my favourite Discovery. With Ford now in charge, it was a clean sheet of paper design, with no carryover parts whatsoever. It famously had two chassis, and power came from a Jaguar 4.4 litre V8 and a 2.7 litre TD V6 diesel, jointly developed with Peugeot. Discovery 4 arrived in 2009 with a glitzier front end, a more Range Rover interior and new engines with a 3.0-litre SD V6 and a 5.0-litre V8. And while the Range Rover Evoque was the car of the moment in 2012, the Discovery quietly clocked up a million sales. The Discovery we have now, 30 years on from the original, is a different beast. Larger, posher and more refined, it's designed for a different audience. The original Discovery's brief was to both ward off the attack from Japanese SUVs and to save Land Rover. Now, the Discovery is a key pillar in what is now a premium brand. While its styling may be a little controversial, the Discovery 5 still shares the original Disco's goal in being a brilliant lifestyle SUV. Happy birthday, Land Rover Discovery!